Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Data Race Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimize your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Welcome to another Vaccination Data Race Seminar series. I'm excited to have today to have Vlad Lushenko. Uh, he is the CTO and co-founder of Quest TV. Quest TV has been uh, something on my radar that, that I'm looking at because they have a lot of cool things that we teach uh, in the advanced database class that are actually implementing in their system. So I'm really excited to have him talk about Quest TV today. So Vlad, uh, before you get started, actually, if anyone has any questions during Vlad's talk, feel free to unmute yourself and fire away at any time. We want this to be a conversation with Vlad and not him talking to himself. For, for an hour uh, in the dark. And Vlad is actually in London right now. So he's at 9, 9 p.m. So we appreciate him staying a little, late, little bit later in the office with us tonight. Okay, Vlad, the floor is yours, go for it. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. And um, yeah, today we are going to talk about how we uh, build QuestDB, um, this, which is a fast database for time series. So, um, a little bit about myself, as Andy mentioned, I'm, I'm a, a CTO and co-founder of QuestDB. I am from Ukraine. I, I live in London, um, UK. Uh, my background is uh, low latency software engineering, and I've been writing code for 25 years, and uh, that's still going strong today. Um, uh, QuestDB uh, started as my uh, passion project in 2015, 2014, I'm sorry, um, in a shed, so to speak. Um, and the dream was, and still is, uh, to this day, is built um, the fastest real-time analytics database for vast um, and unbounded amounts of data, which is what time series are. Um, QuestDB went first in production in uh, 2018. And uh, in 2019, we started um, a company. Um, and uh, the dream became to build the best company uh, that builds the best product. Um, so by best company, I mean uh, the place where everybody can thrive and uh, realize their wildest ideas uh, in a database sense, that is. Um, yeah, so um, why, is, uh, why is QuestDB interesting? Well, uh, I'll start with a bit of a controversy here. And uh, um, I say that we uh, um, set out to write high-performance time series database in Java. And... Um, you wouldn't you wouldn't expect that, right? So everybody everybody these days would go uh, Rust, I'm sure, or, or C plus plus if they're a bit older. Um, yeah, and uh, thanks to my background with banks, uh, I learned that Java can be made to run quite fast. Um, it is a little bit tricky to do, but this is exactly what we have done. Um, and uh, in case you already learned something about Java, um, you will have to. Uh, and learn what, what you learned when you look at the uh, QuizDB code base uh, on, uh, on GitHub, because uh, it really is unlike any other Java project. It's, uh, it's zero GC. Um, it doesn't have any dependencies, Java dependencies. That is, it's a, it's a very lean C-like code base. We, we use uh, uh, off-heap data structures throughout. Um, kind of, we have really low overhead integration with C++ um, code and libraries. We, uh, we use uh, CMD instructions and we actually wrote our own JIT. So it's not a Java JIT, it's, a, it's, it's our own JIT. Um, and uh, of course we use some C++ libraries, but not that many. So those that we do use is, um, is a vector class. Um, library is by Agna Fog. Uh, it's a pretty cool library for CMD. Uh, and we also use no less cool library called ASM JIT for, for JIT. Um, Right, so what, what is the problem that we are solving? And um, uh, the problem we solve is that of providing best-in-class ingestion performance while not compromising real performance at the same time. It's a bit of a, uh, I guess, sounds like a bit of an um, oxymoron, but this is, this is what we set out to do. Um, so all ingested data um, is available for queries in, uh, in um, near real time. So what areas is this uh, important for? Um, one is uh, it's important for nuclear reactors, as it turns out. It is important for crypto markets and trading. That's not limited to crypto, in fact, this finance, fintech, that, that sort of things. 
Um, it's uh, useful for geospatial tracking, and uh, of course, it's uh, it's very useful for metrics as a as a classical use case for time series databases. And um, just to illustrate our kind of ingestion performance, this is a, this is a TSBS benchmark, um, and um, we score quite high um, as this chart illustrates. But at the same time, our query performance is uh, is not bad either. So what you can see here is uh, the benchmark that specifically benefits the storage layout that we have. This benchmark uses uh, JIT and uh, share nothing parallel execution. So uh, this in particular applies to the where close filter. Um, so to be fair, the, the this parallel uh, share nothing parallel execution is not yet released. It's uh, sitting on the branch, and we are kind of stress testing the living hell out of it for now. Um, Clickhouse, as one of our main competitors, performance-wise, um, they seem to do something similar. Uh, I, um, I suspect. It's also, they also employ parallel execution, but perhaps their JIT is, is slightly less efficient than ours. Um, it's hard, hard to tell. But what he's telling here is this time scale behavior, right? So the, this, this benchmark uses um, composite field, composite index, right? So this is index performance of, uh, of typical RD, RDBMS versus an index performance on QuestDB. So that that's the that's the kind of performance comparison we we kind of uh, into, but um, yeah, let let us um, let us dive in a little 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 further into what QuestDB looks like at glance. So um, this is a um, um, sort of ten thousand feet overview of our instance structures. As uh, as you can tell, perhaps we are in proponents of component based architecture. Um, here, ILP stands for Influx Line Protocol Server. So this is a, an, an ingestion endpoint that we have. Um, REST is um, is HTTP server that provides REST API and other kind of HTTP server um, uh, functions. Postgres Wire is is our implementation of Postgres Server, and um, all of these things are written from scratch. There is no libraries used anywhere, and uh, the, it's all dependency free. And perhaps um, uh, some of these components do deserve a deep dive each, but uh, in this talk we're going to focus only uh, on uh, two of them. One one being the storage engine. And uh, the, the other being the SQL engine. Um, and uh, uh, on storage engine, we are going to look at it from um, viewpoint of uh, data ingestion, whilst SQL engine is, is kind of ingress. It illustrates read-only algorithms and how we work with, um, with our data model on, on in egress. Right, on to... Oh, uh, yep. Quickly, uh, maybe you're going to get this. Where is the division layer between the Java and C++? Like, is it both the SQL engine and the storage engine? Like the, the API yeah. coming in is Java, and then you, you go down JNI to, to, to C++? Yeah, it's it's throughout, right? It's, it's no way in particular. So, for example, uh, for, for network endpoints, so uh, we we implemented um, our own um, scheduler for for kind of connections that uses, like, wraps ePoll, AQ, select that kind of stuff. This is C++. It's just uh, on a, on a network layer. On uh, on the storage engine, all of the uh, all of the file access is abstracted away. We don't use Java anything to to access any of the disk kind of uh, uh, thing functions. Uh, SQL engine. Uh, some of the uh, some of the implementations are going to touch on later on. They they do use. Because because we use um, um, off heap memory, so we effectively pass pointers basically from one from Java to C another way around. So some of the algorithms that particularly those that use CMD and uh, and JIT, they are C plus plus. So some of them are Java. So we, we it's it's a it's a it's a mixture. So we we have a freedom pretty much to to move pretty much every any algorithm to, to C++ or Java, depending on where, where it kind of works better. Java is a little bit easier from that standpoint. It's, it's a little bit more kind of, um, there's a little bit more structure to it generally. So like uh, in SQL engine, we have, um, I don't want to bang about this too much, but uh, just, just one more second. So we have um, uh, sort of 
expression parser. So we, we kind of can can basically evaluate random random arithmetic expressions, functions, and stuff like that. So that this this part is implemented in Java mainly. Um, and uh, JIT implements slightly simpler uh, simpler arithmetic. So it, it doesn't call functions, but it can uh, can operate uh, arithmetically with uh, vectors of of basically arrays. It can just add arrays, subtract them, do do these kind of things. So Java C++ split is just everywhere and arbitrarily as we need to. Does, does this help? Yeah, thanks. And could I think about this whole box, like the, all three layers as uh, in the typical deployment of QuestDD, is that a single JVM or like, is, yeah. it, is it, okay. Yeah, for now, for now this, is a, this is a single instance. I'm going to touch base on this 2022 plans to build um, horizontal scalability where uh, where this da this data is going to become re replicated. But for now, it's just one process. Thanks. Cool. Um, right. Storage. Right. So um, I don't know what better way to start about talking about storage um, uh, than types, right? So. It, the one thing is, uh, I would say the types that uh, we have are stored on disk in their in-memory representation. You, you can think about this. Uh, if, you, if you have C++ array, this, would, this array would look identical on disk, pretty much. And why is this important? So this is, this is where we avoid um, type conversion between end user API and storage itself. So, Data is also stored in, in a tabular format. So columns are stored separately from each other. Values in columns are stored densely. And although um, QuestDB is a time series database, it's important to know that the, uh, the manner we think of data conceptually similar to relational database. Um, tables internally are internally and optionally part partitioned by time. So this is done uh, to help SQL Engine reduce the, the I.O. Um, it is a common problem with time series workloads that sort of all data becomes less important and it has to be uh, offlined. Uh, some people offline it to DevNull, some, some other offline it to, uh, to cold storage. Um, and, and time series partitions, well, time partitions rather, um, help by becoming units of, of data movement um, in, in, in our current system. Now, partitions also help um, with ingestion. So in most cases, writers have uh, to concern themselves with um, dealing only with last partition. Um, this, this, uh, helps, um, this helps a writer to keep constant footprint during intense 24 seven ingestion workloads. Um, Data ordered by time um, helps identifying time intervals faster, which also helps reducing the I/O. And uh, and our storage as, as a feature is snapshot uh, su sorry supports um, snapshot feature um, to provide um, read consistency. And uh, snapshot units are typically either partitions or columns. Um, and um, if I kind of would talk about types here, and if I, if I jump slightly ahead of myself, I, I would say that we store columns, column data in separate data files, and that sort of columns never share the same file. And um, speaking of data types, there are three kinds, uh, or, or the, that's the way we look at them. Um, fixed type, fixed size types are sort of easy to um, identify offsets in column files to find values. They use a single file per column. Variable size types use two, two files per column, and I'm going to talk about that a little, little later. And we also um, have a, a symbol type, which is a, is a dictionary dictionary based type. So what, what that is, it, it sort of you can think of it as a, a dimension table, which has ID and a name. And then QuizDB would inline such table while storing IDs on disk and, and displaying names to, to SQL queries. Um, so uh, let's dive a little bit deeper in, into what these types look like on disk. Um, so um, this, is, this is effectively the stru directory structure on the file system. Um, directories are time partitions. Files inside directories are columns. Um, 
these vertical vertical boxes. I don't know if you see my mouse cursor. Um, are files uh, files on disk, and the files contains arrays uh, of data. In this example, we have both fixed and uh, variable size columns. Fixed size columns, as I said, they are pretty cool to uh, to locate values by offset. Um, and variable size columns are a little bit more involved, but not that hard to deal with either. So um, variable size columns uh, is a pair of files. Um, they do share, these two files share the same name. Um, we will call them the I file contains um, offsets into the D file. So D file contains data pieces and uh, I file con con contains offsets of where these pieces um, begin. We also use um, n plus one kind of trick uh, where n is number of rows in the column and n plus one um, we store uh, offset well index file stores offset of append offset of the uh, data column so we can calculate it uh, quite fast data themselves data itself is um, is length prefixed and that helps uh, reduce some of the random random disk reads and um, if we look at uh, uh, partitioning a little bit closer, uh, let's assume we have a, a trades table that is, uh, this is an actual syntax, QuizDB syntax, it's partitioned by hour. And on the left, there's a, a data that, a new data that comes in the table. Um, for simplicity, this data um, timestamp is mixed, in, well, we show just an hour, and it's mixed uh, 7 and 6, 6 p.m. So when, when data does go in, um, we sort the data by time and we partition, and the data is sent to on, on disk partitions after, after that. And let's let's have a look what we do exactly when data goes into, into on disk partitions. So um, there, there are two, uh, two data paths. Um, one is a, Fast, the other is slow. The fastest data path is a uh, is append. It's just by far the simplest in terms of implementation. You can imagine how how hard it is to append an array, so it's, it's pretty trivial. The uh, another data path is merge, which is a lot less efficient. So to choose between these paths, the new data is is analyzed, and what we are looking uh, for is to establish how new data overlaps the existing data, right? And, um, and depending on, on the goal of, of this uh, analysis is to eliminate most of the merge, if, or all of it, if possible. The, after data is analyzed, we create a, uh, what we call a copy tasks, uh, which can be either uh, merge or append by itself, and these tasks are executed concurrently. And to, to imagine the, to understand the level of concurrency here, um, we usually take a single column during merge and we split it into three tasks, each column, and then within each partition. So if you update multiple partitions, multiple columns, that, 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 that would be a swarm of, of uh, small tasks and all of them are um, executed uh, on a share nothing basis. And what's, what's kind of interesting to note here, um, it's not just here. Just all, uh, it's about all of our concurrency um, concurrency code. Is that our concurrent code um, operates or does what's called uh, work stealing? So in essence, under under pressure, if CPU is is not available, the um, code that is about to publish task will also process them because they're not being consumed. For example, from the queue, and uh, th this just doesn't waste time on uh, on waiting anywhere in the code. So we, we, there's never a situation where we publish something and, and we sit there wait for the, for this published task to be picked up. The, the, the question in the chat from Hamid, Hamid, you want to mute yourself? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go for it. Yeah. Okay, so there were several questions over there. Let me just find them over here and read them. <laughs> Uh, so one is that the performance numbers that you showed, uh, are they on a single node double socket, I assume? Um, 
Let me just go back one second. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is um, this, this and this on a uh, uh, single single node. Yeah, it's not. It's we use uh, we we use all available CPU though to uh, to calculate uh, well for both ingest and queries. You can go to the next question. The next question is, is it, it's, it's, a, it's a single JVM process, but it's a multi-threaded process. That's right, yeah. All right, so me, do you want to answer a question about timestamp ordering, uh, out of order timestamps? Yeah, so what about the out of order? Right, so you're ingesting, you know, some of the rows appear too late uh, after you have ingested the previous partition. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, the out of order is, uh, is, is, is dealt with. So this, this, the slide is kind of alludes to the out of order stuff. So merge is something that happens when you have out of order, right? So uh, what we do is we, um, we, we heavily optimize for data being slightly out of order. When I say slightly, um, it's within, for example, if you're publishing from multiple sources, it's within the clock skew of the sources, right? So few few seconds out, that kind of stuff, or milliseconds or whatever. So if, if data comes like that, we, we sort it in memory before it hits the disk and convert it to append. If data comes heavily out of order, like in an in, in instance of, I don't know, you receive data today, I don't know, from yesterday or day before yesterday, um, it's still gonna go in, it's just gonna go on a slow path and we're gonna have to merge existing data or part of existing data with the new data that you ingested. So in a nutshell, um, out of order, any sort of out of order is supported. Um, it's just uh, um, if data is too old and, and falls outside of our optimization pattern, it will be slightly slower to process. When I say slightly, if, if we do uh, kind of uh, 1.2 million rows on, on, uh, on, on a pen pass, on really heavy merge pass, we could be doing 50K or something like that. So it, it will slow down, but uh, it's still reasonable. Okay, awesome, keep going. Cool, I don't know, where was I? Um, yeah, right. okay, sorry, I was gonna ask one more question before. Sure. So when you do the merge, is it the copy and write or merge and read? That is, you keep the delta and then you merge during the read and then in the background, you redo the partition, it's, or or you write away you do it. it. It's a good question. Thank you. Uh, we we do merge and write. So the data that lands on disk, and and uh, it's available for read. It's already sorted, and uh, and merged. So the performance penalty is is on write. So it just we kind of think about this. You, you, you pay this performance penalty once when you ingest the data and you, 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 you pay it never again. Okay, cool, um, right, so where was I? Yeah, so th this, this effectively, this, this slide talks about um, uh, out of order processing, uh, kind of a little bit oversimplified, but this is, this is the idea, so. It's a heavy, heavily concurrent process. We're trying to do as many things as we can to saturate disk or, or, or memory. And um, we're trying to optimize out merge kind of by point arithmetic pretty much. So um, now version in the snapshots. Uh, so this is, um, this is really simple. So um, we create, um, when we create new, new for example, if, if we ingest data out of order, we create new partition directory um, and we, uh, we have current transaction suffix pretty much uh, at the end of and the name of the directory. Um, and when data is ready, uh, when this partition is, is fully constructed and ready, that we update transaction file atomically. And, and, and the readers uh, also atomically uh, read the transaction file. Um, uh, I, d I do mention column versions here, so they, they are not used by out of order ingest, but they're used by updates. So when, when um, there's a SQL update, we, we snapshot only a single column and a new version is created. Um, so 
I guess an eagle-eyed viewer here would notice that we, we can't really cre create copies of, keep creating copies of these partitions forever, and, um, and they would be right. So we would run out of disk space. Um, and then there's a, a feature of storage engine to purge and use partitions. So how does, and this is an asynchronous job that runs in the background and picks partitions to purge. So how does the purge job knows that partition is unused, right? So we use a fairly trick uh, shared memory data structure. We call it uh, transaction scoreboard. So the idea is that um, uh, this structure holds transaction numbers used by SQL queries in flight, right? As soon as um, a SQL query ends and, uh, and results, for example, nobody needs a second pass over the same result. The, um, the transaction number is released and, uh, and uh, you, this partition becomes eligible for, for purge. So I've got like lights turned off on me here. So I don't know if you can still see me. Um, um, uh, yeah, so uh, cool. Um, Do you so, support multi-statement transactions? Could, could you, Andy, sorry, could you repeat that? Do you support multi-statement transactions? Um, no. Okay. No, not yet. Not yet. Okay. So, um, so the whole uh, whole idea behind um, behind writers to table, we we operate single writer to to table, right? So right now um, there is a one to one relationship between uh, table writer and uh, an actual table the user perceives as a table, but uh, in uh, in the future versions the table writer would become um, a shard of a bigger table. So that's the uh, that's that's that's. The I don't know, but like, but you can't like, but you can't call begin and then do a bunch of reads and a bunch of writes and then you know just commit all together at the end. Um, it's 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 kind of half implemented. So um, okay, we 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 haven't. It's not available to use yet, but we do have a system in place to to ensure that's possible. So. The multi-table uh, kind of multi-table uh, transaction is is done via a separate transaction manager generally, right? So you you on this transaction manager you include tables that you kind of want to con conduct transaction over, and transaction manager would use two-phase commit. Well, you just call commit on a transaction manager, and transaction manager would call two phases of commit on each table involved in transaction. And oh, I, I, I'm not even talking about like multiple tables. Like, can I just can I can I have you know update table foo in three separate queries and then commit them atomically at the end or no? Like up be call begin update 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 and then commit and then the the, the you know, oh, yeah, three yeah, updates. Yeah. Are... yeah 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 of course yeah 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 okay okay yeah yeah okay sorry it's, sorry I misunderstood. So multi multi statement multi statement update is is out of the box supported yeah. Okay, so, but it sounds like multi multi table is not. Which is multi table is not yet, but it, it uh, will be. It will be. So uh, just one one small step at a time. So it will be supported. It hasn't been it hasn't been yet requested, kind of in anger, but um, it, it can be supported. I think um, the versioning of columns is is slightly unique too. Like that. I mean, in some ways, you think of it it's like it's a, you know, it's a shard. You can do version of that. Like, like I, I don't know. The, the, the multi-versioning on columns, is it's interesting. That seems unique, but it doesn't, I mean, it makes sense for you guys, but I, nobody else does it this way, which I think is kind of cool. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. So, yeah, so we're multi, multi-table, uh, sorry, multi-column uh, versioning was really introduced by updates. It's just, uh, say, if you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you have fairly trivial update, Kind of statement where you're, I don't know, you, you wanted to increment a column for sake of argument, right? It just does not make sense to to make a copy of entire partition just for that one column. So that that's that that's just just where it came from. But actually, does that mean like the? I mean, the if you do a merge though, and and then now you change the relative order of a, you know of a, of a logical tuple that means you have to update all the other columns at the same time right because 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 unless you're, you're relying on like fixed fixed uh, you're relying on offsets like i want to get to the 100th tuple and i know that's going to be you know tuple one two three and, I, and it, you know so no matter what column i'm looking at if i jump to the 100th position it's the same tuple 
Okay, so we 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 yeah, we don't have tuples as such. Um, but um, so we we're talking here, um, I guess, updating columns that do not change order of record or uh, the records it. in the table, right? Okay, all right, so it's sense. just in this situation. So when 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 update um, when you do update, say timestamp column, which is physical order of of the records, that would involve partition move. So that, that, that there's no two ways around it, right? Yeah, all right, like that. Thanks. Cool. So uh, just just one note about snapshots here. So um, even though uh, all of our kind of snapshot in expedition uh, was born out of uh, out of order and updates, we actually found a good use for it for cloud native backup. Um, and uh, well, if you, if you're in the cloud, um, best thing to use to 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 back up anything is just to take a snapshot right so you you, you take a snapshot of a file system great right so we uh, introduced um uh, quest db well we introduced a sql on quest db that you can run to effectively snapshot all transaction numbers freeze them before be, and and trigger snapshot and then release transaction numbers after snapshot um, system has confirmed the start of a snapshot. So we use the same snapshotting mechanism for backups. So that, that's just kind of one interesting side effect from, from having it. Cool, so on to the next seemingly unrelated topic to what I've been talking about um, is how we add a column to your table. Um, and uh, it's interesting because it's part of the uh, high throughput promise that we make. And uh, um, I'm just going to show you the sort of the low touch operation that we employ to, to add a column. So uh, let, let's assume um, that this is the, the on the slide is a table that you, you have. And uh, this is a time point on the, with the red arrow pointing. This is where you decided to add a column and some values to it. And by the way, the Influx line protocol by definition supports um, adding columns to a table without having to put uh, database into maintenance window or, or kind of introduce some risks, unnecessary risks. So let's let's see how it works. Um, so what happens? What happened here is we um, we did create a column, but only in partitions in which there is data for it. And uh, we we also introduced a marker that we kind of internally called infamous column top, um, the marker that tells which row number the transaction, sorry, the column started life at. So in this particular example, column started life at row number two, and its column top would be uh, would be two. So and as you can see uh, here, the um, the column is not backfilled. So there is no IO uh, of any description, and this operation is instant generally. Okay, so um, if, if if there's a default value though for the new column, like default default you know zero point zero, um, does the engine smart to recognize that? Okay, if the column top is two, therefore you don't like anything before that doesn't have it. But like I know the default value is, so I can fill that in. Uh, it's a kind of yes and no. So we, it's it's non-configurable default. It's non-configurable default value of no, right? For for column, but um, this is a, actually come to think of it, this is quite a smart idea to to put in metadata what value to return. So 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 in essence, uh, it's the internally these columns are kind of stubbed with uh, an implementation that returns constant no, right? So. We could potentially stub them with um, uh, something that returns configured value in metadata. So it's, but yeah, the lo logic is there. So if column is not present, we just return same value for it. Currently, it's no. Okay. Uh, cool. So um, storage uh, abstraction API. So um, before we uh, change subjects somewhat and talk about SQL engine, um, I would like take a, a, a little moment to reflect on design choices that we made for, for building a storage engine. 
Um, and one of them, and it's an important one, is a, a separation of read and write concerns. Um, to be fully honest, the first iteration that's circa 2014 had a single storage API with no separation between read and writes, which, which was a mistake and led to realization that this API should be, should be separate. Um, also, this API provides sufficient abstraction layer from physical storage um, for, for, for the rest of the code, code base not to be affected by changes in, in, in the storage itself. Um, the, the read API is used by queries, but that's not the only API they use. There's there's few other abstraction APIs that particularly uh, facilitate row-based access and, and, and the page frame-based access. Um, also, uh, the other important design, cho design choice, uh, sorry, um, is that um, the the whole code base is is lock free, like there's there's no locks anywhere, and um, we are uh, very big fans of share nothing execution, and we, we're trying to stick um, to it. Um, so there's unavoidable kind of coordination uh, between um, read and reads and writes is done via what we call optimistic reads. Um, so an example would be to say, uh, a read, a reading process needs to read transaction state from a file, right? So the reading process takes a snapshot of, of a transaction file, just reads whatever data is in it, is in it, and then it verifies that that during this read, there was no writes to this snapshot. And the way it does it is by introducing versions at the start end of snapshot and also memory barriers to, to make sure the kind of reads and writes are not reordered uh, to, to miss an update. Um, also, we is a, is a byproduct of uh, of using shared memory. Um, the the reads and writes can coordinate across uh, processes, right? So you can have uh, another instance of QuestDB running as a as a read only uh, read only sort of process against the same um, data file or data files with no risk of this process ever having access, write access to the tables because this is done, uh, coordination is done by a shared memory. Um, so yeah, so this concludes my um, sort of piece about rights. And um, if there are no questions, we should be ready for SQL engine, which is reads. I think and we're good, go for it. All right, cool. Cool, SQL engine it is. So. Um, well, um, this image will be quite familiar to you if you're aware of a volcano model, a volcano pipeline model, rather. Um, we use a, a very similar model because it does make sense. Uh, we, we have a reusable uh, operators that can be arbitrarily combined in the pipeline. So our model and operators are both row first and column first execu execution capable. And um, the latter, which is which is column column first execution, um, is uh, it can be implemented as a concurrent concurrent map reduced re relatively sort of generically. Um, column based execution allows us to leverage the existing storage model pretty much one to one um, and use uh, SIMD instructions to accelerate com computations, and also as as I mentioned, we additionally compile our JIT um, compiler compiles uh, where closes into AVX assembler to, and it's also a CMD assembler to, to accelerate execution. Um, we also, we have a um, handwritten parser that um, allows us to customize SQL syntax to introduce, um, well, introduce interesting shortcuts for common time series queries. Um, and we can talk about the shortcuts in, in a second, but, um, uh, first, let's touch base um, on uh, SQL optimization. Um, so you, so, your SQL dialect is what, like, it's a, the starting the starting point was Postgres or or what? Yeah, it, it was a starting point. <laughs> There's a bit of a history to it. So the starting point was, uh, um, uh, I think it's called uh, ANSI uh, ninety two or something, something to that end. 
Sure, that's that's most basic one now, right? Like yeah, but but then ninety two. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but then 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 we uh, the the next thing that came, we we built this uh, Postgres wire uh, protocol, which forced us into Postgres dialect pretty much. So uh, because there's there's a tons of tools that run their metadata queries and uh, and the Postgres is such that you know if you want to list columns of a table, there is no one way to do it. Every single tool would do it in in their way. I, I, I don't fully understand the, the version all there, but but it's very uh, yeah, it's, it's really diverse. So our dialect is becoming we aligning it with Postgres. But right now we're aligning it with Postgres. It's not fully there, but um, we kind of like our um, SQL extensions because they they help. I think they help with time series, and just sticking with pure Postgres dialect is just an inconvenience to 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 people. Uh, so we we have them, but on on the rest of the SQL is Postgres. Um, right, so optimization. So um, our optimizer is um, is a rule based for now. So we we don't collect um, well, we we collect some. We don't use stats on the table. Um, the goal of optimization is is to to have predictable query performance, and a um, big part of it um, is to avoid processing data that does not need to be processed. And you, you'll, you'll see that in a minute, how, how we do that. Um, there's perhaps like too much on this slide, but um, this is a summary of, of what, summary of examples are gonna go through on the, on the next slides. But uh, I just wanted to stop stop by and talk about um, this dictionary-based symbol, symbol data type, which um, proved to be quite, um, quite a hit with, with our users. Um, so it provides us with uh, two benefits. I can I can talk about them. There could be more, but that's all I could think of. Um, symbol replaces uh, the pesky joins that kind of relational databases use to resolve IDs to names, and it declutters the uh, SQL queries by by huge margin. Um, and also, uh, this unexpected way we use symbols. Uh, symbols are um, known set. So they, they act as enums. So they have an ability to uh, stop query execution after enough results been selected against the, uh, against the symbol. And I'll, I'll show you how we do it in a minute. So let's have a look at some of these, um, some of these optimizations. So um, this, this query sort of demonstrates a, a data reduction. One of this is um, one of our um, SQL semantics, uh, notably where it says time in, right? So this 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 syntax uh, shows well picks all the selects all the rows in the table with eleventh uh, of April and uh, one p.m. UTC. So you would just select an hour worth of data, right? And um, and this is this is pretty good illustration of uh, how we use partitions, also data ordering and lazy data access to to cull uh, large chunks of data and reduce I/O. So um, so here we have three partitions: uh, tenths, eleventh, and twelfth of April. Um, optimizer knows that um, um, it, it, it to produce. Uh, chain of operators that consists of two operators. The first operator would be, will use interval search only on timestamp column. So two out of three partitions will be ignored just because we're looking for, um, for 11th of April here. And timestamp column for 11th partition uh, will be binary searched for interval st start and end. So, so in essence, the output of first operator would look like um, this red red blip um, on uh, on the second step, and and then this uh, subsection of partition in is then searched for where predicate in in parallel and using using sim. So so that would result in a bunch of row IDs that then used to fetch values of all other columns. So that's the that shows how we kind of try and reduce IO pretty much by, by interval filtering. Um, another, um, another example here that uses 
data ordering and partitioning slightly differently. So this is also our own syntax. Just one sec. So perhaps yeah, I should... a, a quick question. There, there's no supplemental indexes or secondary indexes. Like there's no, in your last example, you, there's no secondary index on price. No, there okay. is no. Okay. So the, we we treat our timestamp column as a as a primary index, and this is the order of the rows in the table. And that there's none of these SQLs use any other index. Um, so this uh, well, let me explain this uh, syntax. Um, latest on is the clause selecting timestamp column of a table, and partition by assumes that table has a multiple time series. And the column name here is the one that contains keys to this time series. So from, from our previous example, um, ticker, ticker would contain um, uh, two symbols, a BTC USD and ETH USD. So we, we know, because it's a symbol column, we know there's only, only two values in, in that column. So what happens is the, the operator that's searching, searching the um, column, he will not search from top, it's gonna go from bottom upwards. And the bottom is where most recent timestamps are. So the first row is definitely gonna be a hit. So this, this is the latest for whichever ticker that was. And if the data is, um, is relatively well distributed, then the second row is gonna be nearby. And um, and the net result of this is this operation would perform in, I don't know, half a millisecond or something like that to, to find the row IDs. And this is um, irrespective pretty much of how big the table is, right? So you, you will perform regardless of how, how big the table is. The only thing that might affect it is the distribution of, of, uh, of these values. Maybe the second value will be like, you know, mentioned last year last time that, that that's possible but it's, it's highly unlikely in, in kind of a no in a normal kind of scenarios um and uh the last one last query this is another this is a mouthful right but what this what this query <laughs> what this query does um this syntax um i just wanted to kind of draw your attention to sample by keyword um this is kind of relatively simple syntax to to run aggregate values over a time window which is in this case is 20 seconds um, and uh, e, the sql returns aggregate values for each of the time window time windows you will find and in this case um this is a ohlc um, chart which is open high low and close prices on on, on the time series um, so it's this is possible to do uh, in a um, in a relational database as well. Um, the it's going to be a little bit more syntactically involved to do the same thing, uh, and the relational database most likely than not would gonna have would have to reorder trades table on read on every read right, which we we don't do here. So that's the uh, that's that's the advantage. Cool. Is that so, aligned? Is that is that aligned to calendar? Is that specific to QuestDB? Yeah, it's it's specific. Well, the, the sample by and everything after that is specific to QuestDB. So yeah. aligned aligned to calendar. Um, yeah, it's a bit quirky, but apparently when you when you resample values and the, depending what what sort of time series people are dealing with, uh, the they can be aligned to. For example, you align twenty second windows. So the question is, where does 20 second begin, right? So like where, right? Um, some people want to align it to first observation. Like for example, from the first occurrence, then another 20 seconds, that's one thing. Some other, some other time series need to be aligned to, to your calendar. Like you, 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 in your time zone, you need to align it to you know, midnight, kind of regardless. And actually some, some people need to align it to the end period which we actually don't do yet, but they, they do need to align it to the end period. So you have calculate these uh, intervals in, in the other direction. So it's a little bit more complex. We haven't done it yet, but, but people want that. This is, uh, that latter one is for specific, uh, for, to, to, to help understand this. There's some financial instruments that expire on a random 
on, on a random time, right? And they, they want to align this sampling to the expiry date of this instrument. And that sort of that, that's where it stems from. Yeah, very um, interesting. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's fascinating, really. So the the finance the, the, the world of finances is, is just a, it's it's just it, there could be another data science kind of in there. Um anyway, so quick recap. Um uh, so what, what did we learn here today? So the Quest DB has a is a is a column based and append only storage optimized. Ironically, the whole storage model is optimized for reads, even though we, we don't do too badly on, on, on writes as well. Um, thank you to what well, this is in part thanks to your accumulation of um, uh, smart sort of handling of out of order writes. We managed to achieve this, this kind of throughput. Um, the whole thing, storage SQL engine is built from scratch and uh, and we insist on keep doing it because uh, I, I believe that building things, you know, performance is a function of control. So uh, if we have control over components, we can achieve better performance. And uh, we, uh, we use multi-threaded and uh, CMD based instructions while well, execution uh, anywhere we can. Um, so we're coming to, to an end of it. So what do we expect in 2022, if, if anything? So first, second and third is, is replication, right? So we kind of want to build replication. We would like to do it very right the first time around. So we're focusing mainly on the building block of replication itself is where uh, a table is able to maintain a copy of itself synchronous, synchronously or asynchronously across the network. We are building a cloud, which is managed service. We are uh, building cold storage. Cold storage, uh, a lot of storage engines have it, and this is, um, this is interesting for data warehouses uh, mainly. Um, it's just the ability to transparently for SQL queries to move data from cold storage via, via um, local disk cache. Um, so to, to save cost, pretty much kind of store infinite amount of data at an uh, affordable price. Um, we, have a, we have a parallel execution framework and we wanted to implement more queries using it. So to make more queries run a lot faster. And we also, um, cool features or highly requested features that we usually implement ad hoc. So that, that might be, some surprising coming surprises sorry coming this year yeah and um this is it thank you very much for well listening to my kind of late night gibberish here so um uh, if if you have uh, remaining questions or anything i'm happy to to take them so i will clap and have everyone else i'm not sure why you say late night gibberish because this is fantastic um so I'm open to the audience. If there are any questions for uh, Vlad, go for it. Hamid, I see you ready to go. Yeah, so any comparison with InfluxDB, particularly the new engine that they are building with Arrow format and column now? Um, and, and no. Uh, uh, well, unfortunately, no. So uh, we, we haven't benchmarked the new engine. Um, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, kind of, uh, I've got a sneaky suspicion they um, they they trying to copy existing kind of database engines, um, sort of with this this model. But no, we we haven't tested. We we did test it with um, uh, Influx. I think it's one point eight or two or something like that with the, their old engine. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, we we, ha we do have different different models. But anyway, so you know about that. That was helpful. Uh, Amr, do we have a question? Yes. Uh, hi. This is Aminat. It's from UCSD. Um, oh, hi, Aminat. Can, can, uh, can we go back to your alignment case? What are the different things you can align with? So I, we saw calendar. What are the other possibilities? Where are we? One second. Um, I think it was after this. Oh, yeah. When he, yeah, he, so, he, uh, yeah. OK, OK, OK. So, so right now, um, the possibilities is first observation. So you, you say, oh, sorry, no, 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 no. This no, no, this is not, is not partition, but this is after that. You, 
Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, here, this, this one. This is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Success. Got it. Um, yeah, so we, we can align, as I mentioned, to first observation. So you align it to calendar. Well, we, if you don't specify anything, this calendar would be UTC. So uh, it would align it to that. So um, you can align it to a particular time zone. So you can specify a time zone in which you align it to. And, uh, and you can also specify custom offset to align it to. Um, so th those, those things we can align to. What we can't do right now is align it to the end of the period. So that is specifically we, we haven't implemented yet. Does this help? Do you, see any, do you see any requirement where the alignment clause is a user-defined predicate? Um, could you I'll give me an example? example. I, yeah, sure, of course. So we uh, see a case from healthcare data where people are looking at IoT values coming from sensors. And sometimes they would want to align things to, let's say, the first jump of the day. So if you see more than a 2x jump, I'm making this up, but, but it's sort of like this. Uh, on a day, you align to that and then go uh, n steps forward and n steps backward to do some operations. And, you know, oh, wow. That's where the, um, the, 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 the reason they do it is, you know, this is healthcare data. They would, they think that, you know, between sleep time and awake time, there is a difference in performance or, or some such. Uh, so okay. the condition, the condition that they would put on for the alignment would differ from case to case. Okay, have I get you seen it. this? Uh, well, the the short answer, no. This is the first time, first time I heard about this. So there was nobody asked anything like that. That's one thing. Second thing is, I understand what what you want to do. I definitely understand. I kind of think it works. Uh, well, um, yeah. So. It's it's kind of multi-pass kind of situation, so it works. Anyway, I'll, I'll shut up here. So the Prometheus, I was the, the, what I was thinking about. Prometheus has this um, rate function that they can un, kind of un, understand the resets uh, in um, automatically understands the resets and in, uh, in in counters. Um, so uh, I'm I'm kind of thinking this this is some sort of aligned to to function i suppose almost um yeah. uh -huh. that, that that would jesus christ uh, i kind of need to think about this but i i do I, I, so look the, the good thing the good thing is right so we we do own the, the parser and and implementations we can add syntax for it this is definitely possible um it's even possible because it's open source project. So anybody can do it, it's just us. Um, but yeah, so first time, uh, first time hear it, but let, let me um let me talk to the to the team here and see see what they think and then maybe do a bit of a research where where do you have an idea where else can it be other than um, a medicine? I'm sure we can think of some. Okay. It's basically an it's like an anomaly detection, like something happened. And yeah, exactly. measure measure after that event. Like I don't care yeah, what happens before. Right. And so people will do before and after analysis, right? So this happened and then n timestamps before this and n timestamps after this. We want to see the impact of something. So Okay. You, you know, you know what? I didn't want to talk about this, but uh, we, we're working on something else, which might help. Right. Um so I'm not sure how you currently do it, but I strongly suspect you do it in Python, or, or you might do it in Python, right? And um, what we're trying to do um, is to to build a Python layer uh, on top of. Is uh, just to explain that we have vector kind of storage. We store everything in vectors, and and this is incidentally, it's almost identical to how pandas pretty much expects their data to be, right? So, and um, our kind of um, goal of our project is to be able to uh, run arbitrary Python code inside VM. So you can pull, uh, pull the vector um, via memory reference, and then you can run Python on it, and you can, you can do anomaly detection this way. Uh, that's, that's a bit of a like expanded answer here, but yeah, so on, on, on this um, sample, some, sample by over, function join our slack right 
and then we can we can talk about this in a lot more detail as in sure yeah so that that, that would be good if you, if you if you seriously consider kind of uh using this for this use case we'll build it okay uh so we have a lot of questions to get through um so so patience you want to go next uh yeah i'm also from ucsd uh, I have uh, a question. Like, do you have any benchmark on a uh, huge, uh, like a fast, uh, d small data stream, like sensor data or these healthware device data, where data is very tiny but number is very high? Um, let me just understand. Data is very tiny. In what sense? Is it like a it short? Is a tiny Yes, tiny uh, means sensor is means I'm talking about the ingestion uh, uh, and query capability. Like if your data is very small, like a sensor data for each timestamp, you have only one value. Now you need to um, ingest that thing or you need to index on that, that type of data, like a health healthcare data, means wearable device data. So yes, have... we, we, we are we're built for this, right? Like so. The, the performance in terms of benchmark, so uh, performance numbers are, are kind of uh, relative to the number of values that you send to the database. So this benchmark that I showed, I think I think it has um, 10, uh, 10 tags and and ten values. I forgot what it is. So it basically it's a lot of columns, right? So if on on a, on a pair of values where you've got timestamp and uh, and a value, they, this performance figure is going to be much higher. So uh, it, it, yeah, so we we deal with this. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have uh, one more question from the audience and like a question from the chat. All right. So Nick, you want to go next? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I think my question actually is similar to what Subhasis was asking about. So so if I'm working with like IoT data or stock data. And there's like high cardinality. I might, I might have a hundred thousand sensors, and I really only want to query a couple of them. But the time period is very large. Maybe it's a year's worth of data. So with the current setup, if the data is all stored on timestamp, right, I'd have to scan all of the partitions for that whole year. Is there? Is that the case right now? Um, yeah, that's a good, uh, good question, Nick. Thank you. So, um, uh, well, we, I also didn't mention here, we, we do support indexes on, uh, indices on, uh, um, on symbol values. So, um, in essence, uh, there's, there's a couple of things. So if, if there's no, um, there's no interval in, in the search, there's no other way, but scan the, the whole, whole table. Uh, well, when I say whole table, kind of touch on every partition, whether we can uh, open and read the data in partition, that's another thing, right? So index uh, are, indexes are per partition. So for example, if symbol, uh, if you're looking for two symbols uh, across your entire data set, uh, indexes are built to, to answer a question whether uh, this partition has an index, has the, the value you're looking for, right? So index would, would we would have to open an index right. and, and a, read top of it. Gotcha. Has there been any consideration into sorting the data by that symbol column and then the timestamp? Because like if I'm doing IoT or trades, you know, I almost always care about that identifier and then the timestamp. I don't I don't care about any of the other any of the other uh, signals that are coming in. Yeah. So that is um yeah, the, the, it's it's a fairly fairly the fairly generic use case that we're looking at. So, it's a case of uh, the the way the the way I see it is a case of storing multiple time series in in, in one table, and uh, we we do have uh, a plan, although not immediate, to um, to effectively partition um, within the table by the value of uh, of a symbol. So the, 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 this this way uh, we would. Sort of cut down on IO substantially, so I don't think we have a kind of immediate idea on how to do it best. Consider you mentioned hundred thousand symbol values, um, but uh, there's there's a plan uh, to do it eventually. Okay, 
Yeah, because I was thinking if you just sort it first by the symbol and then by the timestamp, then you can put an index on each of the symbols for the, the day it starts. And I can really quickly look it up. Um, I think that's what KDB does. Let's, let's, can we take this one offline? I think hit up Vlad. Sure. Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm trying oh, to get over So sorry, Nick. Yeah, let's, let's, let's talk offline about this. That is okay. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so there's a question in the chat. They're asking, uh, do you have any plans to support in the engine close to data custom functions? Basically, user-defined functions. Yeah, Python. So the, the we kind of the plan is not to not to implement any um, uh, not to invent the language. So we want to run native Python on uh, on the data. So that's the plan. Uh, and one last question from from Hamid. Me. Can you yes, hear me now? Work. Yes, go okay. for it. Do you handle really multiple distinct time series that you can join? This is very important, particularly for data scientists, because we got multiple devices and then we need to find the correlation across. Yeah. Like so, finance or in healthcare. Well, uh, health, healthcare sounds like a really good area. Um, yeah. So, Yes, yeah, so we support um, we, we support what's for what's called as as of join as as a join. We generally support. I uh, didn't didn't mention in this uh, in this talk. We support all of the uh, all of the traditional uh, uh, relational joins. Sorry, I accidentally hit my keyboard, so a slight change. Um, so we also support um, as of join. As of join is specifically for 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 correlating of time series. Yeah, so we, you can do it. There's Azov join, LT join, this, this sort of things.